In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Welcome back, everybody. And today we're going to talk about real estate and what happens when real estate's involved with the business. And in fact, probably the majority of the business. And there's all kinds of industries that comes into play. Uh, we, we, we talked to uh, John DeVries, one of my agents, about three different businesses, uh, specifically golf courses, uh, bed and breakfast, and self-storage units. And so that's pretty interesting. And then we got some other guests, right, Jessica? Right. And I also interviewed John Wall from Live Oak Bank, and we talked about financing the purchases of these types of businesses where there's a large amount of real estate involved. And there's another SBA program available called the 504 program. And we talk a lot about that and how the 504 would interact with the 7A loan program as well for the business acquisitions to even get you longer terms for the financing options as well. Yeah. And we also talk about another way to finance businesses, which is the EB-5 program. And there's a, and not only finance, but get a green card to come over to the United States. And we talked to Echo King, uh, f- actually she's from Orlando, and she is an expert in the EB-5 program. So that's a great interview as well. Yeah, so we have a lot of good information today. If you're looking to purchase a business where real estate plays a major component in the acquisition. So let's get to the show and hope you learn a lot. Let's get to it. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Hey, we're back and we are talking about real estate and business of real estate and and how businesses are interconnected with real estate sometimes. And sometimes the business's uh, value is really tied into the real estate or the real estate is a very important part of it. And one of our agents, John DeVries, who is a top broker uh, here in South Florida, it's more like the Treasure Coast up in uh, Stewart and uh, Port St. Lucie. Uh, in our office up there has sold several businesses that were real estate intensive. Uh, John, welcome back. Yes. Good morning, Andy. So John, um, let's talk about three of the deals. I'd like to talk about three of the deals specifically. Uh, and, uh, I'll take the first one, which was a storage business. Now those historically are kind of a real estate play, almost like a landlord play, right? Yes. So this was interesting because not only did this individual own the storage facility, but he also had a moving company and uh, he actually was, uh, uh, had space an office space in the storage facility and, and he had his own moving business. So the, the obstacle we had here was there was really two aspects to it. One, you had the storage facility that had its own revenue stream and then you had the moving company, which was another business. So uh, this was this was very interesting uh, situation, right. and we actually sold separately. So yeah, the, the, there was a buyer that was uh, that purchased the storage facility because he was not interested, obviously, in being in the moving business. And then we had another individual that purchased the moving company, and even though they had a symbiotic relationship there, because there was revenue streams that were going that were, that the storage facility was able to. Uh, uh, compensate on by having the moving company uh, being at their location. It was a great relationship for the moving company and the storage facility to be together at one location. But two aspects to it, the seller was looking to sell everything. So we had to uh, find two separate uh, buyers for that. Right. So, and, and that deal specifically, uh, talking about the self storage business, it big industry uh, has its own association uh, you know, again, I, I think most of the self-storage units have been built up from, you know, kind of a startup kind of situation. But now we're starting to see the resales where people are going back. You know, any advice on, you know, someone who wanted to get in this, buy a self-storage business, how much they're valued for and those kind of ideas? Right. So storage facilities, obviously, um, 
are, are bringing in more revenue because per square foot than any other kind of rental space uh, because they have so many individual uh, units and and the rent that they're able to obtain for each individual unit. So so basically the uh, the storage facility that it was we you had you know, several different components to it. You had you know the land value, the building value, and then also the revenue uh, stream that was coming in. So obviously they had to look at all aspects of that, but um, uh, it, it was definitely an interesting uh, uh, deal to put together. Okay. And if, and let's move on to another type of business that uh, we've sold several of is, is the golf course business. Now that's a, you know, that's a, an industry where people think that it might be tailing off at this point and some people are closing golf courses, but you know, there's people, people are going to still play golf. So there's still opportunities there. So how does someone look at a golf course as far as, you know, buying a golf course and how they, how do they value it? Yes. Well, golf courses, uh, notoriously were are getting a much higher value years back because they're, they were able to get more money per round of golf and, and their revenue stream was just coming from golf. Now golf courses have to tap into as many profit centers as they can. So they uh, have the restaurant portion of it. That's another revenue stream. They have the pro shop and that's another revenue stream. So they're doing events and parties and all of the different types of revenue streams to make them more profitable. And, and that's what actually is, is enhancing uh, some of these golf courses that are making more money than others are really based on tapping into all different types of uh, uh, revenue streams. Yeah. So obviously if you're, if you're looking at a golf course, you're probably just not looking about how many rounds they have. You're probably looking at deed restrictions. You're probably looking at catering facilities you know, and, you know, obviously there's still opportunities for s- small business people, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's um, many opportunities out there, especially, you know, like I said, in these, in these uh, uh, different businesses have to be as creative as they can today to try and bring in as much revenue as they can. And uh, with the competitive nature of this, this industry and many other industries, uh, they have to uh, uh, make sure that they're working, going after every, every aspect of what that business can bring in. So the last uh, example of a real estate business that is reliant upon the, a business that's reliable, reliant upon the real estate is a bed and breakfast. And we've sold several, you know, a few bed and breakfasts. And I can remember uh, some of the deals that you have done uh, you know, what's important when you're looking at a bed and breakfast as a business opportunity? You know, everybody thinks they want to own a bed and breakfast, like it'd be an easy kind of business to own. But, you know, what are some of the nuances of buying a bed and breakfast? Well, you know, a bed and breakfast is a lifestyle change. Uh, you know, typically it's the individual that, you know, is interested in in not only uh, having a small type restaurant, whereas that, you know, they'll they'll have their their breakfast meals that they prepare for their guests, but they interact with their guests. And that's the, and that's the, uh, the basis of a bed and breakfast. So, you know, the one that, um, that we facilitated a transaction on, uh, obviously it was about the location, about the fact that, uh, you have smaller rooms. It's not a hotel. Uh, it's more of a intimate type of, uh, of, of atmosphere. Yeah, and this bed and breakfast, which I've seen other bed and breakfasts do, it's kind of a destination place where they have small events as well. So that can be, you know, sort of a, a revenue stream for them as well, right? Right, exactly. So again, you know, they need to, uh, you know, in order to make it profitable, tap into all aspects of of what, um, you know, what revenue they can bring in. So it's whether or not they're holding small parties and events and bridal showers and intimate parties like that along with, um, you know, the money that they're, they're able to uh, get from, from the room rentals, but also uh, having a, another type of atmosphere for people to either rent kayaks and bicycles and, and do all different types of things, which is how they bring in most of their revenue. Yeah, I, I, I think you kind of started it where I think we should probably end this conversation is, you know, it's a lifestyle business. It's certainly something that you want to commit to that, you, you know, you, you want to have fun, but it is hard work. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're in the hospitality business where you're entertaining your guests. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's 
you know, as, as we said, it's a, it's a lifestyle that uh, someone is looking for. Uh, they they enjoy interacting with people, having those small parties. So um, you know, it's a, it's it's definitely a lifestyle change. So uh, I'll I'll wrap up the whole conversation with John. You know, if you had to give a buyer some tips about buying a business that's kind of real estate intensive. You know, what are kind of the things that, you know, people need to look for or, you know, actually, you know, come to you for some good advice? Right. So, you know, when you're looking at a, a real estate acquisition, obviously you need to uh, support that with many other different types of profit centers. And uh, that's that's where we come in to show them the, the value of not only the business, but the real estate and all aspects of how to value that type of business. Yeah. And I think, I think that's really important. That's why coming to trans world, when you have a business that is not only a real estate play, you know, it's, 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 it's a bowling alley. It's a, it's a golf course. It's a, it's a bed and breakfast. It's a self storage unit. Uh, you know, you want to get the value not only out of the real estate, but as, as an investment in a business. So we do that very well. John knows this business very well. John, if somebody wants to get in touch with you to talk about their business, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Certainly. You can reach me at um, my email address is john, J-O-H-N-D, as in David, at T-World, excuse me, Tom, W-O-R-L-D.com, or 772-260-7647. All right. Great job. Uh, Thanks very much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Hey, Andy, you know what time I think it is? I think it's time to talk about our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Hey, we're back with deal of the week. And we are talking with Jack Slider from Trans World Charlotte. And he's got a great example of a business that's heavily reliant upon a real estate deal. It's almost more of a real estate deal than a business deal. But again, at Trans World, we do such a good job of kind of packaging the two and getting value for both. So, Jack. Why don't you tell us about this deal? Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, when you mentioned this to me, um, the first thing that came to mind, well, you, you you say more than once, good deals for good people. Well, that's the first thing that came to mind. These were an incredible couple that called me um, out of the blue and said, uh, his first words were, uh, Jack, you sell wedding venues. And, and, and in my mind searched back on wedding venues. I got a strip mall with at the end and there's, you know, a drop ceiling. And so I didn't have a lot of hopes for this. But when he started explaining what this wedding venue was, uh, it turned out to be a multi-million dollar, beautiful, absolute beautiful piece of real estate. Uh, This was a gentleman who had built this real estate, uh, built this estate to literally castle specs. Um, It had had huge, like thick walls and and beams over the sand and, and, you know, just immense structures inside. And he had, they were living in this house, this castle, and uh, running a wedding venue out of it. Um, and uh, it, and the reason he was he was calling me instead of a real estate broker was because it's a business. It's confidential. We've got they had they had uh, uh, bookings going a year out from people from India and all over the world. And he did not want the the word to get out that uh, you know obviously that it's for sale. Rides are going to start canceling. They don't want, you know, any doubt about their wedding plans. So we had to sell this like a business. And I knew it was going to be tough because it's residential. It's a, it's a, it's a house, but it's, it was, it was, I wish I could show you pictures. It was, it was fantastic. It had themed rooms and, and it was just, it was really fantastic. Um, And the, uh, the couple was just in a, in a, in a really tight emotional spot and, and some uh, financial um, concerns and they really needed this deal done and it was it was a privilege we went through a series of buyers ended up getting a buyer that was moving into the area that wanted to do exactly the same thing they wanted to come in and run this business out of the home while they lived in it and it was just a perfect match um, and it was uh, it was an incredible really an incredible process took us about nine months to sell it and how much did it sell for? And what was the approximate SDE? Um, that's the interesting part, which made it partly difficult. The SDE was very low. It did not cover the assets. Uh, it was, uh, I, I want to say it was around $100,000, $150,000, which considering the $3 million 
asking price for the real estate, it was too low. There was reasons it was it was that low because it was very it was a very new uh, wedding venue and the and the the, the uh, trend was up rapidly. So it was growing rapidly, getting its uh, you know uh, awareness and so forth. So there's reasons to have hope for it, but we needed to sell this for the asset value, and it ended up selling for about two million dollars. Great. And so if people want to get in touch with you with another wedding venue to sell, how best, <laughs> how best to get in touch with you? Um, uh, my first initial, last name, J. Slider, <laughs> spelled just how it sounds, J-S-L-U-I-T-E-R at tworld.com. Or you can call me at uh, our office phone is 704-840-8390. Uh, Perfect. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Today, as you know, we're talking about real estate as a business. And as we're talking through these deals, we thought it would be helpful to bring on a lending expert to talk about financing real estate as part of a business acquisition. So back on the show is John Wall from Live Oak Bank, and he is a senior loan officer and also an expert in the SBA M&A space. So John, thank you so much and welcome back to the show. Jessica, thanks again for having me. Always a pleasure to be part of this and uh, help out your listeners. So let's talk about uh, the 504 program with the SBA. And why don't you just start off by telling our listeners what the 504 program is? Absolutely. So there's uh, kind of even take it one step backward. There's two primary programs available out there, the 7A and the 504. The 504, as Jessica was referring to, is a program that is specifically designed for real estate only. And unlike the 7A program where the bank holds the entire note and has a guarantee from the SBA, the 504 program is where the bank is the primary lender and you partner with a CDC or a certified development company who is the SBA's arm of the transaction. The way that these loans work, which is a little different and definitely a little more complicated, so you want to make sure that you're working with an expert if you do go down this road, the 504 loan is where, and traditionally, the bank will hold 50% of the project cost. The SBA, when there's a change of ownership, will do 35% financing on it. And then the buyer is coming in with 15%. One of the kind of more complicated pieces is that the timing on these 504 projects is not the same. So the bank actually will do two loans when the closing occurs, they'll do their permanent piece for 50%, and then they will do a bridge or interim financing piece for the 35 or 40%, depending on the type of transaction. And then that 35% gets paid off by the SBA, who issues a debenture on the secondary market once a month. And typically for them to have their closing and get that funded is 60 to 90 days after the actual transaction will close. So I think it's real important for your listeners to understand that there's multiple moving pieces and at the end of the day, they're going to end up with two separate loans, even though it's under just the 504 program. And in many cases, a, another loan through the 7A program will need to be done as well because the 504 can only finance real estate. So a lot, a lot of information in this program, but it is a great program because it does allow the borrower to receive below market rate interest rates since that debenture that is sold by the SBA is backed by the full faith and repayment ability of the government. So investors love that type of paper. And it's up to a 20, they have both a 20 and 25 year debentures currently, which is, you know, helps a lot with cash flow on that real estate component. Right. So say, John, somebody's looking to buy a business that ha is very heavy in real estate. So let's say, you know, for example, a golf course, like how would that transaction work? Would there be a loan like a 7A for the business portion and then a loan for the real estate portion? Or do sometimes they get rolled together or how does that work? Yep. So there, there would be two options to go. The 7A program does allow you to finance everything, you know, the kitchen and the, the sink, everything in the whole project under that program. So that would be one option. The other option is to look at the real estate component of that project and finance that through the 504 program and then finance the intangible or the blue sky or going concern, whatever term you want to use, and finance that component under the 7A. 
So in theory, you could end up with three loans on a project that includes real estate where there's the going concern, future cash flow, blue sky that's being financed through the 7A program. And then the real estate is being financed through the 504 program under those two loans, the bank and the SBA. And one reason that someone may want to really consider or may even have to go with the 504 program is that the limits for the 504 program are larger than the 7A. So the 7A will allow you to go up to $5 million. A bank like Live Oak could do conventional on top of that. However, the 504 program allows you to go up to $12.5 million for a real estate project. So you do have a lot greater runway on a larger real estate heavy project than you would on the 7A. Right. And also, like you already mentioned, longer loan terms too on the 504 projects. Correct. You can go up to 20 or 25 years on a 504 project under that loan program. And if in most situations, you're going to combine that with a 10-year term on the 7A. I think it's real important for your listeners to, to understand one thing about the 7A program. A few years ago, they started to allow, if you do have a project that is primarily real estate, meaning 51% or greater uh, use of proceeds that are going to real estate, you can to use the entire term of 25 years for that 7A program. So that's something that's really beneficial for buyers now is, you know, when it's more than 50% real estate in the project, you can get a 25-year term under the 7A program as well, as opposed to 504 program, which is 20 or 25 years combined with a 10-year 7A. So... Wow. That's a great benefit. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on the show and explaining that to our listeners. If a listener wants to learn more about you or connect with you or Live Oak, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Absolutely, Jessica. I'm always happy to speak to your listeners or prospective buyers about projects that they might be listening, looking at. They can contact me two ways. They can call me directly at 303-551-4453. Or they can also feel free to email me at john.wahl at liveoak.bank. Great. And we'll drop that contact information to the show notes too. John, you and Live Oak have been such a great partner for Transworld and a lot of our clients. Thank you so much for the work you've done with that and also for joining us on the show again today. Thanks, Jessica. Always appreciate it. And thanks for the partnership with Transworld. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Yes, it's Listing of the Week. And we are here with John DeVries, uh, one of our most successful brokers. And he, uh, you know, does specialize in kind of real estate-based uh, transactions. He's done a lot of them. And one of the interesting niches in a real estate-based uh, transaction is the golf industry. And so, John, today uh, you not only have a golf course, but the whole club for sale. Yes, this is a very interesting opportunity. Uh, this is a um, uh, a company that actually owns four golf courses, and uh, they're looking to uh, actually uh, sell one of them at this point, uh, moving on to other investment opportunities. Uh, this golf course is um, uh, of 141 acre uh, golf course with a 7,000 square foot uh, clubhouse and a 3,000 square foot uh, maintenance building. Uh, they have also uh, other parts of real estate that are attached to it for residential building. So it's a very, very interesting opportunity for someone. One of the other interesting opportunities is that they have an assumable mortgage. Uh, their asking price is uh, $2.6 million, and they have a uh, $1.8 million assumable mortgage. Wow. Sounds like a really interesting deal. If you want to come down to the Florida sunshine and uh, buy a golf course and, uh, you know, really a private club and, and a facility, uh, it's certainly a great deal. And John, how best uh, someone get in touch with you? Uh, yes. If you'd like to see this 18 hole golf course and maybe uh, go out and play a round or two, uh, please call me at 772-260-7647. Or uh, you could email me at John D at tworld.com. Great, John. Thanks for coming in today. Welcome back, everybody. And we have a special guest with us today. I have Echo Meishan King from the King Law Center. 
And she is an expert, and their firm are experts uh, in many things, but uh, particularly we wanted to talk about the EB-5 program today. So welcome, Echo. Hi, Andy. Thanks. Thank Th- you. Yeah, thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it. So, so give us a little background of where you came from, and you know how you got, you know how you got into uh, working on the EB fives, and uh, maybe a little, you know, what's happening today. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm originally from China. I was born and raised in China, but a second generation of Koreans. So I speak uh, Chinese and Korean. I uh, moved to uh, United States uh, uh, like uh, in 2000 year 2000, so it's 19 years ago. Uh, I had a, a law uh, background from China, at, at, you know, and then I, when I moved here, I was also interested in the law, so I went to a law school here, got my JD degree, and started to practice uh, immigration. And since uh, when I was in school, I was interested in uh, EB. This is a, a, a type of uh, investment uh, immigration program that, you know, many Chinese people from China are interested in. Um, and I've been practicing at EB-5 uh, almost exclusively uh, since 2010. Well, that's great. So, so obviously you have a, you know, and we do know that, that, uh, that it, EB-5 is very popular with people who are immigrating from China. So, so, you know, what have you seen as far as projects? I know the EB-5, uh, you know, requires a project. So why don't you give us a little bit of background of how that works and then how people kind of get involved. Sure. Um, there are two types of EB-5 uh, programs. One is called, <clears throat> excuse me, Reason Center Program. Uh, uh, 90, 90% of the uh, uh, project in the market right now are uh, Reason Center uh, projects. And the other type is Direct EB-5. Uh, you know, there are two, the difference is uh, the Reason Center project it can uh, use um, indirect job as the uh, job calculation method, uh, while uh, the um, direct EB-5 can only use a direct uh, job calculation. Uh, EB-5 program requires uh, 10 jobs per investor, 10 new jobs created per investor. So in a typical uh, reason center project, um, the 10 jobs can be calculated indirectly. Uh, most of the, uh, the projects are such as hotels, uh, real estate, most of them are real estate developments, such as hotels, you know, condominium, apartments, residential, uh, or shopping malls, office building. Uh, and for direct EB-5s uh, are more uh, labor intensive uh, since the, uh, the, uh, there's a 10 direct job requirement. Uh, the direct uh, EB-5 projects are like, uh, you know, the uh, restaurants, uh, <clears throat> shopping, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, supermarkets, schools hospitals, uh, those type of car wash, those type of uh, projects, uh, uh, and also assisted living facilities. Those are very popular uh, direct uh, the uh, projects. So, and, and I, I think there were, were some recent changes to the investment level. So what are those these days? Yeah, they have been talking about in both uh, legislative and regular, uh, the USCS immigration, um, the, uh, they're t- both talking about uh, increasing the minimum investment amount. Right now, current investment uh, minimum investment amount is a half a million in the uh, targeted employment area. But right now, they're t- they have been talking about to increase it to uh, over one million, from half a million to over one million, uh, and that's a, a drastic change. And uh, I we uh, there there are a couple of uh, you know the uh, proposals too. I, we think probably. Uh, within this year or within several months, uh, it's very likely that the law will pass. So, you know, and, you know, half a million to a million, yeah, that's almost double. So it's a big, it's a significant jo- uh, jump. And it's been, you know, that way for a while. But so some of the projects that you're seeing, are they, you know, are they located in one place or several places like the West Coast of the United States or Florida or, you know, where are you seeing most of these EB-5 projects? Are they all over the place? Yeah, they are all over the place. Uh, very popular places, uh, you know, California. Uh, Florida is also one of the uh, very popular uh, states that has a lot of, uh, you know, those uh, AB5 projects like New York, um, those uh, states. But they are there. They can be everywhere, anywhere. 
So how does the EB5 project get initiated? Is it, you know, the developers decide, hey, let's try to make this an EB5 project or does the immigration, um, you know, the person who's immigrating decide, hey, can I find a deal, then make it an EB5? How do you see that happening? This, this EB5 program, in my opinion, is a very good, uh, it's a win-win situation for developers and for the investors and also actually for the, uh, the, the, uh, the country U.S. Uh, as well. What happened is when a developer is seeking for uh, finance, uh, the uh, EB-5 can provide them with a, a very lower financing uh, channel. So they can, you know, the, uh, uh, get the uh, through EB-5 uh, financing in, in addition to their conventional uh, the financing through the bank. Uh, that makes it, and also, uh, the, uh, you know, the EB-5, EB-5 investors they uh, by investing a half a million or one million, uh, the whole family can uh, immigrate to the U.S. So most of the you know those investors are uh, the successful business owners. You know they're very successful in their own country, and then once they come to the U.S., they will definitely contribute to the U.S. economy. And for the uh, for the country for the as a whole, uh, since there's no uh, it's not the that uh, millions of jobs are created without any taxpayers, additional taxpayers' money. So this is also uh, we co- we consider this a very uh, good uh, policy in the program. Yeah, sure. It's bringing in millions and millions of dollars annually, if not billions over its lifetime. Correct. So it's yeah. a, it's a, it is a great program, and and so again, um, you know, if people want to get involved uh, in an EB five, or that you know we have buyers or, you know, even uh, contractors or sellers or people who think they want to start an EB-5 project is the best, is the best way to hire someone like you to help kind of structure it? Yes, definitely. Uh, the uh, a successful, uh, the, the, the project uh, documents is, is very, is crucial to the, uh, you know, the whole uh, project success. So uh, we will do is, we will structure the, uh, the 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 business for them and structure the uh, the whole um, uh, organizational you know and the uh, financing source and the and then they will contact they will either go to uh, through the agents in overseas or uh, they have other channels they can you know recruit the investors uh, but the first step is to uh, hire immigration attorney and the security attorney to uh, draft the uh, uh, basically the draft the plan for them. And and so and and one question: Do multiple people share EB five projects sometimes? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Because what do you mean? Uh, uh, you know, like project? if it's a ten million dollar project, can it be? Oh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, this is uh, you're talking about region center project. Right. Uh, a large uh, de- development, a uh, real estate development uh, project. Usually, uh, they will have like tens of millions of dollars. Uh, you know, investment funds are needed, then they can, if the jobs support, if the number of jobs is support the, uh, the number of investors, for example, if this, this uh, you know, if the economist can conclude that a project has, can create 100, uh, 100 new jobs, then they can uh, recruit uh, 10 investors, basically, because each investor will have to create 10 new jobs. Uh, in that case, then they can recruit up to 10 investors and each investor will, you know, contribute half a million. So a uh, $5 million, uh, you know, will be uh, in this the whole uh, the project. $5 million will be uh, subscribed uh, from the uh, from 10 investors. That's great. That's great. That's a, you, You've given us a lot of information today and we're just about running out of time. Echo, how, how best uh, someone get in touch with you? You want to give your website and your phone number. So if they want to talk to you about EB-5, uh, they can give sure, you a call. Definitely. Yes. Uh, my Our uh, website is www.kinglawcenter.net and our phone number is 407-901-3535. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Echo, for coming on today. Really helpful. Lots of great information. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for tuning in to our show today. If you like the podcast, don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcasting app and leave us a review. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, visit us at tworld slash the deal board or email us at the deal board at tworld.com.